What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Blue Collar Enlightenment Show, where we learn new things every episode through conversations with guests from all around the globe. I'm your host, Jonah, and if you're new, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Today's guest is John Leister, an author of nearly 100 novels. Enjoy the conversation. What's up, John? Welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you taking the time and talking with me. How are you doing today? I'm great, Jonah. How are you? Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's great. Oh, I'm doing just fine. Weather's starting to clear up here in the uh, middle middle part of America, and it's a nice sunny day outside, so I'm enjoying it. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, we've had a pretty mild January, you know, above zero, which is pretty remarkable for Vancouver. I mean, mild, Vancouver, that's mild. Mild for yeah. us, I believe, is like 40s, 40s, 50s. Holy, holy. So. Like Fahrenheit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have Celsius here. We're in the we're in the metric system. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we we like to do things a little different down here. Oh, that's cool. Oh, when in Rome, right? Yeah. So tell me and the <laughs> listeners just a little bit about yourself, man. Sure. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, I'm 57, and um, I kind of spent the first two thirds of my life not really doing very much. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a comic book artist. I was really into Marvel and DC Comics and. I was drawing every day for three to four hours a day, but I got lazy and I gave it up. And then uh, after high school, I thought maybe I'd give acting a try. I've always had a very artsy spirit. And um, I don't know if you remember a show called The Big Valley. It was an American show, Western, from the late 1960s, probably, before, probably long before your time. So one of the stars of that show, Peter Brecht, he came to Vancouver and he started an acting school called the Brecht Academy. And that was an amazing experience for me. I was an extra in Rocky IV. And I got to meet uh, Gene Hackman and Richard Dreyfuss. I don't know if you know who they are, but they were really huge uh, back in the day. Yeah. And uh, I don't mean to throw to you or any of your listeners out, but I've always had very dry skin. And so what happened was I developed psoriasis. And I don't know if you know what that is, but it's basically a, a mental condition where a person's body generates far more skin than usual. It's kind of mm-hmm. like having dry skin to the nth degree. So I wind up with like these red patches all over my body which I still have a little bit it's abated somewhat over the years and so I I decided to give up on my dream of acting just because I was I had too much of a chip on my shoulder about it and I always kind of grown up with feelings of low self-esteem I had a very abusive uh, a home life I don't need to play the world's smallest violin I'm just sharing my story I mean some kids are very abused and they go on to do amazing things with their lives you know they take all that negative energy and turn it into something positive i wasn't so much one of those kids i kind of absorbed a lot of that stuff and and i allowed it to kind of kind of keep me down keep me you know sort of at this level when i could have done much better with my life so what happened to me and here's where the story might get a little bit weird for some people and maybe a little bit difficult to digest about three years ago i was 53 well i'm 57 i guess four years ago now I kind of felt like I was reaching the end of my rope in life, not in terms of like actually offering myself or anything like that, but I thought, gosh, you know, I've had my like 20s, 30s, and 40s, and I've been a security guard of all things for 35 years, and I've always felt my heart, mind, and my soul that I was meant to do something bigger, and that I could always do something creative, and so what I did was I reached out to God, and I said, God, you know, I've been hearing about you my whole life. I've always been something. I would never call myself a full-blown atheist because at the end of the day, I don't think any of us really know. I mean, there's a hypothetical. It's the unknown. What happens after our corporeal bodies finally end? But I said, you know, God, I've been hearing about you my whole life. You know, I'm going to take this leap of faith because I think that I'm the kind of person who tries a little bit harder when I have it in my mind by that someone who loves me, someone who accepts me unconditionally, unconditionally, easy for me to say, for who I am, is watching me, watching me, kind of like Big Brothers in 1984, but not in a harsh way, you know, not in a cruel, you know, punitive kind of way, but in a loving way. Kind of like, imagine you're a kid and you're playing baseball, and maybe you're just kind of blacking off that day, you're playing Little League, and then suddenly your dad shows up, or your mom shows up, you know, the one who loves you the most shows up, and suddenly they're watching you. You know, your attitude might change a little bit, right? You might try a little bit harder. So once I took this leap of faith, I began to feel, and I'm not suggesting that anything mystical happened, but I began to feel a sense of decompression. I began to chillax a little bit. I began to accept myself. And I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, you know, what I've always wanted to do is right. That's always been the one constant in my life. 
And over the first two or three, say two thirds of my life, I've made these sort of sporadic half hearted attempts at writing, you know, kind of on the back of a pizza box or on the back of a candy bar wrapper kind of thing. And so just to backpedal a little bit around 2005, I created this character called Lee Hacklin. He's a private investigator and he's a ladies man and he's a smoker and he's a drinker and he's a badass, but he's got a heart of gold and he loves people. So around 2005, I was working at this one site as a security guard and it was the world's easiest job and there just wasn't very much to do and I was under stimulated. So I started popping off these short stories one after another. I wrote about 50 or 60 short stories about this character Lee Hacklin. I've always loved stories about heroes and villains. You know, I grew up reading Rome, Tommy Folkmore. I like romantic stories. And those are the kinds of stories for the children. Not so much the quote-unquote naturalistic kinds of stories, although I like those too. So anyways, after reaching out to God, I dusted off these short stories and I read them. And I don't know if you do any creative writing, Jonah, but it was the first time where I was able to read something that I had written as if somebody else had written them. And it was a big deal for me because I thought, gosh, you know, I know this is not great literature, but I really like this guy, Lee Hackman, probably because he's me. I mean, he's basically an idealized version of myself, which is something that I think a lot of writers do. I think that's what uh, Ian Fleming did when he created James Bond or Tom Clancy when he created Jack Ryan. You know, they're just creating these sort of, you know, bumped up versions of themselves. So, I cobbled these short stories together, and they, or some of them anyway, and they became my first book. Here it goes, shamelessly plugging a product. My first book is called The Collected Cases of Lee Hackman, 1970s Private Investigator, book one. Hang on a second while I catch my breath. And so I don't know how old you are, Jonah, but I, I'm, I'm 57, as I said, and so I was alive at a time when none of this technology existed. And I'm not really a very technologically adept guy. I'm not saying that to beat myself up. I'm just the kind of guy you got to show me over and over and over again. And, you know, it just might take me a little bit longer than a younger person to learn some of this stuff. So for me, it was a tremendous uphill battle just to get that first book posted back in 2019. I was dealing with Amazon, and I had it in my mind, I, you know, three clicks of the mouse, and boom, I'm a cell phone. You know, it didn't work out that way initially. Uh, Amazon was rejecting my banking information, and then I would go to the bank, and then it was the right information, and I was going in circles, and I was going to the library every day after work on my day off, and I had tremendous help from the library staff. And this is another important life lesson I feel, is that some of us, especially men, I think, I mean, I don't mean to stereotype, but, you know, we guys, I think that generally we're not so keen on asking people to help us. You know, we like to think that we can do everything by ourselves. At least that's my hallucination in the world. And so, you know, we have to put our egos on the shelf sometimes in order to get what we want out of life. So I had tremendous help from the library staff. And so after maybe a hundred tries of, of trying to get this book, I thought I had to give up on Amazon. I actually deal with Draftsby Digital now, which is another uh, a website for, for people who want to self-publish. And maybe we'll, maybe we'll come back to that. So if there is such a thing as parallel universes or parallel timelines like Star Trek or Back to the Future, you know, alternate reality. If there's an alternate reality where I tried to do this a few years ago and I didn't have God in my life, just knowing who I was back then, and again, not to be overly self-denigrating because who I was back then wasn't such a horrible guy. I just didn't have that substitutiveness. I just didn't have that dogged determination. So I probably would have given up after two or three tries. But because I had taken the piece of faith, because I decided to accept God in me. I had it in my mind's eye. I say that a lot, mind's eye. I had it in my mind's eye that he's watching me. Like God is watching me. Well, John, do you want to change your life or not? Do you want to manifest? Do you want to align yourself with the John Light so that you are always meant to be? Or do you want to just go back to the couch and pound down junk food and watch DVDs every night? Because that's how I lived my life for the better part of 35 years. I used to be very overweight. I used to weigh about 200, anywhere from 235 to 250 pounds. And I'm now about 170 pounds. And that's another thing, just as a sidebar, after letting God into my life, my diet changed dramatically. You know, I, the vegetables started looking attractive to me because I think that when you, when you love yourself, and it's not narcissism to love yourself, when you accept yourself, you're more likely to make better choices in life. At least that's the way it's worked out for me. So when I finally, after maybe 100 tries, saw on the screen, your, your ebook has been published. I just thought, oh, man, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, this is a very unusual feeling to me. I actually started something 
and there were hiccups and variables and potholes and speed bumps along the way. And for once in my life, I didn't fail. Like I actually crossed that finish line. And so for me, that feeling of elation, which was an, an unusual feeling for me, was uh, uh, has been a motivator because I want to feel this way all the time. And actually, I just uploaded another book today. I think I have almost 100 of these books online now. And I'm going to keep doing this until my corporeal, corporeal existence ends. And so that's my story in a nutshell. I was, that's what, what one of my questions was going to be. I was going to say, no, I've never really done any. Well, I can't say it's too creative. I used to write poetry a little bit here and there, you know, but never really anything big. Okay. Um, well, poetry is big. <laughs> but, you know, that was my question was how many books you had out. And after B, after writing so many books, do you still get nervous publishing them or is that kind of, no. is it kind of just a no. run of the mill type thing? It, 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 oh, I don't want to, well, I don't want to go too far in the other direction. I don't want to be, you know, complacent about it. No, I, I mean, I'm super jazzed every time I publish a book, but I, after I published that first book, I still had some hiccups with Amazon in terms of them rejecting my files. I don't know if it was a problem with the website. I shouldn't say anything negative about Amazon. It seems like they practically rule the world. But I discovered another platform, and this may be a good tip for some of your listeners who want to sell public shoppers. I found a website called draft to digital It's free. It's super easy to use. It took me like all of five minutes to post my first book with, with draft and digital. And what they do is they springboard your books to other platforms. There's like seven or eight other platforms, like there's Barnes and Noble and Apple and Kobo, and then maybe five or six others. And so my stuff's out there. And then I found another website called Poster My Wall, and that's how I designed my book covers. And then again, it's free, it's easy to use, it's fun to use, and it's only over been over, over the last year or so that I've that I've you know designed these covers. So I mean, doing this, what I'm doing basically is I'm following my bliss. This is what I was meant to do with my life. I think that we have a destiny as individuals. Of course, it's not just going to plant itself down into our laps like you and your podcast, right? That didn't just happen on its own. You willed your podcast into existence. And I think what I have now, what I didn't have before 2019, I didn't have the knowledge of how much fun I would have doing it like how much joy this would give me. And I like to think that those feelings of joy spread out globally. I absolutely believe that. When we feel lousy about ourselves, when we're going through life, you know, walking down the street, looking at our feet instead of looking forward, you know, when we give up on our dreams, when we give up on our bliss, those negative feelings, I absolutely believe, become global. They actually affect other people. Kind of like when you walk into a supermarket and you're getting ready to cook a nice meal for your family and you're in a good mood. And then 15 minutes later, you're putting your groceries in your car and you're suddenly in a lousy mood. You know, what happened? What happened was you absorbed all the negative feelings of all the other shoppers in the supermarket. So that's my mission statement to it. And for goodness sakes, you know, as long as you're relatively healthy and as long as you have some cognitive ability left in your mind, you know, never mind age, never mind whether what you want to do makes you any money, and especially never mind what other people think. I've had to disengage from some people in my life, just a few people, whom I really love and really care about and always will, but the support and the enthusiasm just isn't there. And I think that even in some cases, there's a little bit of, of jealousy, or like I was told by one friend of mine, he's like, hey, John, don't talk about your book. Like, I never want to be around that kind of energy. I want to be around people who are, and this is just my opinion, this is just the way that I feel about it. I want to be around people who are as, who are rooting for me as much as I'm rooting for them. You know, I love to hear about other people's uh, uh, calling and self-manifestation, whether they're super successful at it or whether they're just taking that first baby step you know, going back to school to get that degree or starting to write a book themselves or a podcast or getting their pilot's license or whatever it might be. So that's all. Yeah. Uh, what What was your favorite book to write in all of those? Okay. Well, I, get, well, I love all of them. It's kind of like asking your parent, which, which one's your favorite child, right? But I would say uh, The Treehouse Avengers which is um, my first, my, my very first novel, kind of like your first love, right? 
And so the Treehouse Avengers, can I talk about the story a little bit? Go for it, man. Okay, sure. So it's very autobiographical. It takes place in the 1970s. It's about a 10-year-old boy named Clint Wagner. He's kind of a Charlie Brown kind of kid. He's overweight and he's insecure and he's lousy at sports and he's, he's not good at school and he's abused at home and he's bullied at school. You know, he's just having the rest of go of life. And he desperately wants to be a part of this boys group called the Treehouse Avengers. And they're a group of kids who hang out in a treehouse after school and on weekends and they, they read comic books. And of course, it's a huge comic book nerd as I was when I was a boy. And so uh, another character named Billy West, who's the leader of the Treehouse Avengers, he says to Clint one day, and this is, this is the basic plot, he says, okay, Clint, you know, we don't want you in our, in, our, in our group or in our gang, but if you want to be in, then you have to commit to the seven tasks, kind of like the seven labors of Hercules. So, for example, he has to fart in class when the teacher's talking. He has to bring his mother's underwear to school. He has to, I don't want to spoil the whole plot. He has to... Um, he has to go to an X-rated movie in Times Square, the story is set in New York City. And he actually succeeded, succeeds at doing this. What he does is he wears his Charlie Chaplin Halloween costume, and the woman who sells him the ticket is an octogenarian. So he gets, it's a very, you know, it's intended to be an all-ages book. The movie, he, well, more or less all-ages. The movie he ends up watching is like a bunch of topics when he's playing volleyball. You know, it's pretty innocuous. But lo and behold, his dad is in the theater, and uh, his dad's in and his dad is very abusive. <laughs> telling him, uh, Clint and his mom that he's in a tennis club and that he plays tennis every Saturday when in fact he's been going to this, you know, X-rated movie theater in Times Square. And then um, there are these two bullies and Pug and Mike who are, uh, um, who are merciless to Clint on a daily basis and what they wind up doing at the end, I guess I'll, I guess I'll give away the whole game a little bit, but they try to burn the treehouse down and Clint comes to the rescue and over the course of the story he loses weight, he gains confidence in himself. He's mentored by the school principal, who's a World War II veteran, who kind of takes Clint uh, under his wing and teaches him how to box. And so when Pug and Mike show up and try to burn the treehouse down, uh, Clint, you know, puts the fire out, and then he gets into a fist fight with the two boys, and of course he kicks their butt. And then after all of this, Billy says to him, okay, you're in, Clint, you're a treehouse avenger. And Clint's like, no thanks. You know, I, don't want, I don't want to be a treehouse avenger. I just want to be Clint Wagner. And so the theme of the story is really, you know, self-acceptance and, and, and having the desire to be a leader and an individual as opposed to, you know, a follower and just, you know, a P or a P and a pi. And that's the Treehouse of Engines. And so I think out of all my books, I like to say that I'm equally proud, but I mean, if there's one that I think, and other people have told me this, if there's, if there's one that has the most potential, you know, for a movie uh, or, or a Netflix series, you know, they usually point to that one. And, and do and all... It's a standalone. It has a beginning, middle, and end. Do all of your books have one of those messages like that that you try to portray? Yeah. Uh, yes, 100%. I, I try to do that. I'm not afraid to preach. I try to do it in a, you know, I try to do it in a way that's entertaining. You know, I try to do it not, not in a folding wolf snowflake kind of way, but all of my books, even my Lee Hawkins, well, especially my Lee Hawkins, they have a very old school morality you know good is rewarded i mean they might i put my heroes through the ringer i put my heroes through every kind of physical and emotional uh, hardship that i can i can think of but ultimately they are triumphant by the end of the story because i think that those are the kinds of stories but those are the kinds of stories that i like i mean i like stories that are uplifting you know you look at the most popular movies of all time they tend to be very uplifting right you leave the theater like whether it's star wars or lord of the rings or harry potter or, or whatever you or with the Marvel movie, you know, you tend to walk out of the theater or you feeling uplifted, right? You feel better about yourself, you feel better about other people, at least for a little while, you know. A little while is better than never than never, right? You, you feel better about, about life and you also feel like maybe the whatever the problems that you have in your life, because we all have them, that's just that's just the way that it goes, you know, are maybe not so insurmountable. So yeah, when I when I wrote my first Lee Hackman short story, I kind of thought them, thought them, thought of them a little bit as Aesop's fables, these sort of hard bit and crime stories, but with, with a kind of moral at the end, or, or, or something that that the reader, you know, might be reminded of if they already know. Because I think we all need, need to be. My hallucination is that we all need to be reminded of some basic things sometimes in our lives. Because let's face it, all of our lives go south sometimes, right? All of our lives, we feel like, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. And so sometimes you may need to read something or hear from someone else or in my case from God, like, you know, 
they're there, you know, you're still alive, you know, you there's still, you know, you got a lot of years ahead of you, you know, just, just, you know, chillax and accept yourself and, and for goodness sake, don't beat yourself up. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are just, that have this inner struggle and it is, it is 99.9% .9 manufactured. You know, we just buy into so much negativity. And the moment we start to disengage from that negative, here, here's a specific example that maybe is a little bit more concrete. I don't watch the news. I, I spend very, very little time watching the news because I'm a recovering news junk. I used to listen to all these political podcasts, and very conservative podcasts, you know, the Johnny Ken show and the Ben Shapiro show is another one. And, and I found them to be very engaging and stimulating, but they were also driving me crazy. And they certainly wasn't doing anything for my psoriasis because stress and anxiety uh, exacerbates psoriasis. I also, even more than that, I think that it makes, it makes our bodies physically weaker. In other words, I believe, and this is not a scientific opinion by any means, John, but I believe that the worse we feel ourselves, about ourselves emotionally makes us more susceptible to physical disease. I, I absolutely believe that there's a correlation between the two. So once I disengage from all that stuff, like people tell me, did you hear this? Did you hear that? It's always followed up by something negative. It's always followed up by something that I really didn't need to know. You know, you walk into an elevator now, and there's a screen on the wall, and it's telling you about something horrible that happened somewhere in the world. You know, you might have been in a really good mood before you, you were given that piece of information that is really, I mean, unless you work in the field, is really of no benefit to most of us whatsoever. It just it just makes us feel bad, and it it, it it disempowers us. And so I try to live, I, mean, I don't mean to be artsy fartsy, but I try to live my life in a way that's empowering so that I can be the John Lester that I want to be. If I didn't have these books online, if I didn't have God in my life, I wouldn't be doing this right now. I wouldn't be reaching out to nice people like yourself, trying to connect with other people around the world who have that same kind of passion for life. Yeah. Uh, and I like to tell people, you know, 90% of the stuff that you go through is your own mentality. And a yeah. big thing yeah. is to step out of your own way, unlock mm -hmm. your cage yeah. and step out of it. You're in your own way and it's your mind telling yourself to stop. And it's blocking you. And if you could get past that, the the possibilities that you have oh, yeah. are endless. The gates open up. Correct. Um, that works. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so how do you go about marketing your books other than social media? Oh, uh, well, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would love to have an agent. I would love to have some representation. I mean, I'm just, I, I'm in a lot of groups. Well, I'm actually in hundreds of Facebook groups. And so I, uh, pretty much every day, I write pretty much two to three pages every single day. I mean, I'm at a point in my life right now where I don't think I can go to bed without cranking out at least a couple of pages of my dollars to Google thing. And then I transcribe it into my, lap, my laptop. And so I make videos of myself, I'm reading my stuff into my phone. I usually make two or three videos a day. And I post them on my Facebook page and I post them on my Facebook group page. Plug, plug, plug. My Facebook group page is called Johnny's Way. And uh, I've got over 600 members now. And, and basically that's what I'm doing and reaching out, reaching out to podcasters like yourself. And I have it in my mind's eye that someday somebody out there who has, a, has some money and has some power, who, who, who makes decisions as to what gets made and doesn't get made, Someone like an Alan Ladd Jr. He was the guy who greenlit Star Wars back in the day when George Lucas was trying to sell the original Star Wars. And nobody was fighting. Everybody told George Lucas. And am I comparing myself to George Lucas? Yes, because I believe in my story just as much as he believes in what he was trying to sell. And I think that's an important life lesson, too. You can have a really great idea, and everybody around you is like, oh, you want to make a movie about what? Wookiees and Jedi Knights, are you kidding me? The Force, what's that? You know, a lot of people told, told George Lucas that those kinds of movies were done, right? But Alan Light Jr., who's that executive at Fox with Green Lake, he said, here you go, George, here's, here's $8 million, you know, go make a stupid space movie that nobody wants to see, it's going to cost me my job. You know, we have to roll the dice sometimes in life. And, and lo and behold, it became, you know, the most popular movie of all time, with countless spin-offs that continue to this day. So that's my dream. I don't want to be super wealthy. That's not my, that's not my mission statement. 
what is my mission statement for me is that there, the day will come when I'll be able to say that it's my creativity that pays for my Starbucks coffee and not my ability to provide a service. I'm still a security guard. I work 40 hours a week. It's a physically demanding job, and I love it. But when I'm not working, I'm, I'm going for it. You know, I'm, I'm doing it. Every time I open my notebook, it's like the words, I can't get the words out fast enough. I make myself laugh. Sometimes I make myself cry. I discover new things about these characters. And it, that's another important life lesson I feel too. You never know what you're capable of until you actually do it. And then you discover, it's like, wait a second. I'm actually enjoying this a lot more, like infinitely more, than just sitting in front of a screen and running through somebody else's story. So like last year, I saw maybe five movies. I used to watch five movies a week. I mean, I used to come home on my days off and box sets, DVDs, and watching all the special features and listening to the audio commentaries. And the special feature that always drove me the craziest was the writer's room. I'd be sitting at home pounding down my pizza and watching these writers talking about next week's episode of 24 and absolutely feeling that if I was in that room along with those other writers, I would have something to contribute, even though I don't have a formal education. And so, again, that's my message to the world. You know, better late than never. You know, never mind yesterday, because as soon as we start thinking about the past, I think we tend to feel sad whether it's a happy memory or a sad memory. And again, it's disempowering. When we think about the future, and I don't think, I, just, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I don't think it's just me. I think that we have a tendency to worry. I mean, human beings are just so much, so much alike in so many ways. But when we have our minds centered in the here and now, just the here and now, then we feel strong. Then we feel like things are possible, right? I mean, and that's my philosophy. And it's been working for me. I think that, uh, you know, you do say it's better late than never, but, you know, there's a piece of advice that I'd give to all young people is that you're not going to be good at anything unless you try, Absolutely. unless you get out there and you try it. Okay. Right. Try the thing, try the things you enjoy first, because if you can succeed there, you can succeed anywhere else. Right. And, and you have to be able to take criticism. You know, and failure. You, right, and failure, yes. And people are going to make fun of you. You know, the second guessers and, and the people who are, who are in the stand watching you and I when we're in the arena of life, right, taking the risk, taking the hit, putting ourselves out there. I mean, the whole world could think that my books were total garbage. If, if I knew for a fact that the whole, that everybody, every single human being in the world thought that I was the world's worst writer, I would still keep writing because I love to do it, and I know that I'm not the world's worst writer. Haven't you ever seen a movie and then walked out of the theater and thought, I could go home tonight and I could write a movie about, I could write a screenplay about the last argument I had with my wife, and it would be more entertaining than this stupid $300 million CG gonzo fest that I just wasted my money on. Yeah, not going to lie, that's about most of the movies nowadays anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, so do you have a ritual before like i have a ritual before i sit down and i start recording do you have a ritual ritual before you sit down to start writing no i was i was asked i was on a i'm glad you asked i love this question so i was on a group podcast a while back there were about 15 people on this podcast which was not it, it was very unwieldy to have 15 guests on one podcast because everyone was talking over one another but this question came up and i was the only one in the group, that group of 15, that didn't have a quote-unquote ritual. No, I just open my notebook and I start writing. You know, I was on a, I was watching an interview with Arnold Schwarzenegger on a, a documentary called um, Stan Paul. It was about the life of Luke Brigno. And Arnold was talking about how incredulous he was that some of his fellow bodybuilders had to psych themselves up before a workout. And he said, I never have to psych myself up before a workout. I can't wait to pick up those things. He said, if I had to psych myself up, I wouldn't do it. That would be like a red flag that this is not a good fit for me. Right. So for me, you know, I can't wait to open my notebook. I can't wait till my lunch break comes around at work so I can crank out a couple of pages, you know. And I guess just to answer, I mean, the only ritual I have is this quote unquote ritual is I just tell myself if I, if I get, I never really get writer's block per se, but sometimes it takes a while for the engine to get warmed up. Like I'll have my notebook and sometimes 10 minutes later, I'm still looking at a blank page. <laughs> yeah, that's how, that, like, that, 
that's how the podcast goes sometimes is that you know sometimes it starts off real slow and you have to get it going you have to get yeah. it going real quick like, and you like know sometimes. sometimes you know with with some of these programs now out that you had to pay for and podcasters you know some of us indie podcasters don't make money doing this we do it for free wink wink you know me and so we don't like to pay for these upgrades right and we like to have these free things and so it's kind of like you said it's like an engine you got to warm it up and you got to get it going and once you get it going it's perfect yeah and so i just i just tell myself you know just start writing when i was, when I was in high school uh i had an english teacher the late great mr henderson he had to do an ex i'm so glad i had this have this sense of memory we did an exercise called speed writing and so basically he would write on the blackboard I was walking home from school, dot, dot, dot. And you had a stopwatch. And so all of the students had to write nonstop for five minutes, you know, like a stream of consciousness. And of course, some of us came up with some really wild scenarios. And that's basically my, my quote unquote writing process. It's kind of like jumping into the deep end of the pool. I'll start off with a very general idea, like the book I uploaded today, plug, plug, plug. It's called Lee Hackman, 1970s Private Investigator in. Fantastic. And it's about a serial killer, a stuntman, a Hollywood stuntman. Well, that was the original premise. But as I, as I was reading, it turned out that the motivation for the killing of these stuntmen had nothing to do with the fact that they were stuntmen. And that's my favorite thing about writing is that feeling of discovery. Like some writers, they, they plot everything out in advance. They make out little cards and they, they structure the story, you know, kind of like a, like a pre-production. And, and then they start writing the novel. That's great. You know, hey, whatever works for you. But for me, that takes all the fun of writing. For me, the fun of writing is just, is just doing it. You, you, again, just starting off with the basic premise. You know, Lee, like I, one of my Lee Hackman's is called Picture Frame. And so I was like, okay, I've never seen Lee, I've never seen Lee as a prisoner before. So Lee goes to prison. Why? He's been framed. Well, who framed him and why? You know, it's almost like doing a crossword puzzle. And again, I just spent so much of my life watching other people's stories. I've, I've seen a million movies. I've read a million novels and comic books and TV shows. And what I'm doing now, and it's what I think all writers do, is we're just, we're just fitting all that stuff back out within our mind. But what makes it quote-unquote original is that it's coming out of our filter. There's 7 billion of us in this world or so, give or take, right? And we're all, we're all the same in some ways, at least in terms of our biological functions. And in terms of our emotional needs, we all need to feel loved. We all need someone in our lives who loves us. But the fact that we have these unique experiences and that we have unique people in our lives who are unique to us, that's what gives us that, that story. Because you look at, there's only three basic plots, man versus man, man versus himself, and man versus nature. That's it. That's it. Or, or you can look at it another way. You can say that all stories are David versus Goliath, basically. And it doesn't matter what the genre is. It could be a rom-com, it could be a sci-fi, it could be a Western or war movie. There's you have a hero who, who's generally weaker than whatever it is he's trying to, to overcome. That, that's it, you know? And so there you go. I mean, as far as rituals go, no. I, I just jump, I just jump on in. That's awesome. I just got a few more questions for you. We got about five more minutes. What has been the most enlightening moment of your journey? Oh, man. <laughs> I think, okay, I think just that I can do this. You know, when I, when I wrote that, I mean, when I wrote Treehouse Adventures, I had it in my mind at the time, you know, maybe this is it. I mean, I have these collected cases of Lee Hackman's short story books. There's about eight of those. There's eight or nine of those. And then I wrote Treehouse. And I thought, you know, maybe uh, I'll just spend the rest of my life trying to get this stuff made into a movie. Or even just like a, a, a fan film or try to try to hook up with people who are like-minded trying to manifest or try to get, you know, a mass media thing going. But then I started asking myself, like, what if, like, what if Lee's mother was accused of a murder? That became homicide. What if there was a nuclear bomb in New York City and Lee had 24 hours to find it? Um, he gets down and buggy, you know? It, it, that has been the most enlightening aspect for me, if that's a good answer to your question. Just the fact that I can do this that I know in advance now that when I upload a book, I will start another one 
on the same day. And actually, I, I started my next one last night. I have two cages in my duo tank uh, at home in my apartment in Cipollano. And when I get home, I'm going to start start the next book. I didn't know three years ago that I, that I could do that. I didn't know three years ago that I would have the confidence in myself that I have now. I didn't know three years ago that my life had meaning and that this is what was going to give my life meaning. So for me, that has been very enlightening. That's amazing. I think uh... getting, getting, getting older for me has been nothing but a win because it's motivating. The older we get, the more aware we become of the five minutes of time, how limited our lives are. I mean, I'm lucky I made it this far. And, and of course, as we get older, time goes faster and faster. Mm-hmm. I was watching an interview with William Shatner once. And, you know, William Shatner, he's done everything, right? I mean, he's lived, he's squeezed every juice of, of, of the lemon of life, every drop of juice, right? He was in outer space recently. And the interviewer asked him, like, how, well, how is it that you have this incredible passion for life and so many people don't? And he said, because I feel the size of death scratching my back all the time. And that's how I feel right now. But for me, it's been a positive because it's motivating me to manifest over being a couch potato, which I was when I was a younger man, simply because I didn't believe in, believe in myself. I just bought into, and it's easier. You know, it's like Yoda said in uh, The Empire Strikes Back, right? That the dark side is easier. It's easier to buy into other people's limiting beliefs right and not question them because if you question them then you run the risk of alienating those people and maybe they're relatives you know maybe they're your mom and dad and so if you're if you're a fearful kid then you're, you're just not you're not very likely going to manifest whatever it is that you're meant to do with your life some kids are stronger you know i had a friend i went to high school with and he and i remember him saying to me i've known i wanted to be an engineer i always knew i wanted to be an engineer ever since i was five years old well after high school he went to university and he became an engineer but boom. like he had that clarity in his mind's eye when he was a boy some of us just just don't have that and so i think that we were more vulnerable we we're more vulnerable to outside influences so what we need to do and my advice to your listeners who are maybe going through what i was going through three years ago my advice is Develop a philosophy for yourself. Look at all the pre-existing philosophies and kind of cherry pick what works for you and, and implement what works for you. If you're an atheist, if the idea of God is too esoteric for you, you're a very empirically minded person, but you're where I was three years ago, kind of feeling like you're spinning your wheels, then for goodness sake, but, but you want to manifest, then again, have it in your mind's eye that the person who loves you the most is watching you. Do it for them, you know. Do it for your kids. Do it for your wife. Or, or if you have no, if you're alone, if you're alone, they just imagine, <laughs> imagine, pretend that there's someone who loves you. I hate to uh, you cut know, you off, you but the sure, Zoom, sure. Zoom call is going to start definitely. kicking you off. But uh, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, man. And uh, I will keep in touch, and we will get back together soon so we can keep this conversation going. Thank you, Jonah. Cheers. All right, bye, everybody. Bye. That's all the time we have for today. Head over and check out our website, thebceshow.com, where you can subscribe to the email list and contact us. But remember to leave us a rate and review. It helps a podcast with that pesky algorithm. Thanks for listening, y'all.